Mr. Louis Chua. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I would like to declare my interest as an employee of a financial institution in Singapore. Mr. Deputy Speaker, the last I checked, Bitcoin is now at a record high, or was at a record high of around 31,000 US dollars, having risen almost fourfold over the course of 2020, far surpassing the previous highs of around US, US dollars 19,800 set in December 2017, just before its precipitous crash in the months after. Many have called Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies a massive bubble. But fast forward to today, as alluded by other members of this house, 2020 is perhaps seen as the year where industry players, where industry players see 2020 as a year where Bitcoin was perhaps being institutionalized. Conventional asset managers such as Ruffer and Mass Mutual now have Bitcoins as part of their asset allocation. PayPal is enabling cryptocurrency as a funding source for digital commerce. And our very own DBS and SGX are launching the DBS Digital Exchange in December 2020 to welcome the mainstream adoption of digital assets and currency trading. This is a further testimony to how banks and institutional investors, both local and abroad, are trying to keep up with the times to ensure that they remain relevant in their financial services offerings. And indeed, the recent approvals of the new digital banking licenses in December it's indicative that Singapore is taking a leap forward in attempting to become even more competitive as a global financial hub. Against this backdrop, it is heartening to note that the MAS is also very quick to update the Payment Services Act 2019 so as to strengthen the regulatory frameworks, especially with regard to anti-money laundering and countering terrorist financing. And in keeping with the spirit of progress, we should also consider the progress made in assessing payment service provider applications and the pace at which approvals are given. Now, I note that while the Act came into force on 28 January 2020, there remains about 361 companies that are still on the exemption list and awaiting the outcome of their PSA license application. I understand that the MAS has a list of admission criteria, but these are not meant to be exhaustive. Will the Minister provide greater clarity as to the factors and their respective uh, weightings and cons in the MAS considerations in granting or rejecting PSA licensees? And more importantly, what is the number of applicants at the various stages of approval and what is holding back the MAS from approving or rejecting these applications? Is the team overseeing the approvals adequately staffed to support the timely developments in this arena? Now, on that note, I would also like to seek clarifications on some of the proposed amendments to the Payment Services Act. The first is with regard to user protection measures. And Section 21 of the amendment gives the MAS the power to impose user protection measures. However, there is no clarity for now as to what these measures might be at the moment, although the MAS will consult both the public and industry on any implementation of such measures. The MAS has also highlighted in an April 2020 FAQ paper that it does not intend to provide any regulatory safeguards for investments in digital payments, the safety and soundness of DPT service providers, or the proper processing of DPT transactions. And in light of concerns surrounding business failures and cybersecurity, I believe a clear framework should be adopted and put in place as a preemptive measure which aims to imbue users with greater confidence in the payment services infrastructure in Singapore. And wider adoption of digitalization can only be built up when consumers have adequate trust that the system works and that adequate circuit breakers or minimum fail safes are present to mitigate any damage. An example of which is the deposit insurance scheme in the case of monies in banks. A balance has to be struck, however, as mentioned by my colleague Leon Pereira, there is the perception that increased regulatory powers by the MAS may spark fears of overregulation and excessively stifle innovation. In this regard, both end users and companies could benefit from greater regulatory and operational clarity sooner rather than later. 
The second point I would like to highlight is with regards to the potential upward revision of the current limits on e-wallet users. Now, under the current Payment Services Act, e-wallet users can hold no more than five thousand Singapore dollars in their accounts, while they can transact no more than thirty thousand Sing dollars each year. According to the MAS, these limits are in place to safeguard the risk of excess monetary outflows from bank deposits to non-bank e-money. With the signing of the new trade agreement with the UK, the MAS has said that it would review these payment limits. I would like to ask when is the review expected to be concluded and with the expected passing of the Payment Services Act amendments, could the review then be expedited? Because a higher limit would mean that firms can potentially offer more services to their customers, which in turn encourages wider adoption and usage of digital payments in line with our hope for developing a smart nation. Finally, and more broadly, I would like to touch on the fact that despite the great strides we have made in advancing technological adoption, it appears that cash is still king in Singapore. With COVID-19, we have been forced to adopt digital contact tracing, which, much like digital payments, make use of the scanning of QR codes. I'm sure members will agree with me that the scanning of safe entry QR codes is now second nature to Singapore residents. Yet the uptick for digital payments remains slow as compared to a country like, say, China, where the authorities had to intervene to ensure that merchants still accept cash as a mode of payment. Quite the opposite of Singapore's experience today, with cash-only signs still quite commonplace at small businesses in Singapore. I note that the SG Digital Office was established in May 2020 under the IMDA, but beyond hawkers go digital or seniors go digital, we could perhaps ask ourselves, why is it that the uptake of digital payments still remains slow in Singapore, and if more can be done to encourage the uptake of digital payments in the near future? Mr Deputy Speaker, to conclude, the payments industry is a rapidly developing one with huge potential for growth, and I'm heartened that we are riding this wave in the hopes that we will remain competitive for many years to come. At the same time, of course, let us not forget that the older generation might not be as proficient technologically and we should push for progress while also being cognizant of not leaving anyone behind. Thank you.